as usual, it's for it's the tenth year. This is the tenth of November, two thousand and five. We're with Professor Theo Hermans at the University of Barcelona in the English department, and Professor Jackie Murphy's office. To whom our thanks. Theo, uh, can you describe briefly what your current position is in the academic world? In the academic world, I am officially Professor of Dutch and Comparative Literature at University College London. I am head of the Dutch department. Um, I run two MA programs that are interdepartmental, so one MA in Comparative Literature and one MA in Translation Studies. So you're a very busy man. I suppose so, yes. And not just in translation, you're Comparative Literature and Translation. Okay. I'm interested in how you got to where you are. You can go back to your mid-twenties, for example. What would you have been doing around then? younger man? When I was 25, I'd, I was in the middle of a PhD and I was about to board a plane for Algeria because I had been called up by the Belgian army. I didn't want to go. You're Belgian, you didn't mention this. Yes, I'm a Flemish. Belgian, I'm a Belgian citizen, a Dutch-speaking Belgian citizen, therefore a, a Flemish person. I had studied in Ghent, University of Ghent, I'd done uh, English, German and Dutch there. Before that, I'd studied Latin and Greek, uh, and a bit of Spanish. Uh, so I had a, a number of languages by that time. After the first degree, I went to Britain, because I wanted to study comparative literature, and I thought that translation might be a good way into that. So I went to Essex to do an MA in literary translation, I think one of the first programs in that field in, in the country. And then after a while, realized that in Britain, as opposed to Belgium, for example, not all universities offer all subjects. So there was no German at Essex. And so I left Essex after a year to go to Warwick and to start a PhD there. And uh, that wasn't comparative literature. So uh, French, German, and Dutch, and, and, sorry, and English uh, literature, poetry of the modernist period. And when I was about two years into that, the Belgian army, who was that cons conscription in Belgium at the time, told me that I couldn't go on deferring military service and called me up. And since I didn't want to go, I went to Algeria for two years, got a job at the University of Algiers in the Department of Foreign Languages and taught English literature, saw a bit of the world, lived in a different society altogether. And when that was done, went back to Britain, finished PhD and got my first job. In? In Dutch studies. Okay. Uh, and since then, so after a few years when I felt Dutch became too, too narrow, I began to build a niche, as it were, uh, in comparative literature, and then afterwards adding translation that allows me to do what I'm still doing. University College in London. No, that was at Bedford College, okay. a different college that's within the University of London. And then eventually in 1983, Bedford College closed down, it merged with a different college, but on the outskirts of London. And because there's only one department of Dutch in London, we thought we had to be in the center. So our department moved to University College, which is where we are still at the moment. Despite your constant and prolonged interest in, in literary concerns, you're still best known, for us at least, for two books. One on the manipulation book, uh, Translation as Manipulation. No, the Manipulation of Literature. Thank you. And the other on Translation in Systems, which also has problems with the title. Uh, is it fair that we look at those books as, as, as your main contribution to translation studies? Or how do you feel about those two books? The first is 1985. If I That's right, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's not a matter of fairness, I suppose. Uh, one writes a lot and things get picked up, but it's quite unpredictable what gets picked up and, and, and by whom and what for. It's just a matter of, of luck or chance, uh, goodwill. Um, the manipulation book um, became influential for reasons that I have never been able to fully understand. Um, it was a complete surprise to me, certainly, at the time. I mean, we put it together at the time, or at least I had the idea of putting it together, because this so-called descriptive paradigm in translation studies had been developing for a number of years, in the, from the, about the mid-70s onwards. And by the early 80s, the people began to drift apart. And because it seemed to me that it might be useful to try to gather some of the material that had been produced 
in one book as opposed to collections of essays and conference proceedings in, uh, published in different places. It seemed to me it was useful to try and bring together some of that material, place it with a respectable English publisher, and bring it out. But of course, what the effect it would have, I could not have predicted at the time. I heard surprised afterwards. You're surprised that it has had yes, some yeah, impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard afterwards people say that's exactly what we wanted to read round right about that time. But that's not sheer luck. It's, it's spoken about as the book that created uh, descriptive translation studies. Well, Most after the event. Is that an unfair description? It's an overstatement, of course, yeah. yes. Well, no, no, no single book creates things like this. It's, it's a number of individual people who produce a body of work over time. And again, some of these things catch on because other people happen to be interested for whatever reason. Uh, and it grows like that. I mean, that book may have been a crystallization up to a certain point of some of these statements. Well, in your, the other, the other book, Translation the Systems, which is 1997. 99. Thank you. I was supposed to edit that. <laughs> uh, you speak about that in terms of an invisible college. Yeah. But you speak about it in the past tense there, very much. I, I have the feeling, looking at that book now, that uh, you're really putting end to a period of, of translation studies. Is that the way you feel about that now? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, the book was meant to be uh, at, at your invitation, of course, meant to be an account of descriptivism. So how it had grown, what its key ideas were, what it had achieved, what kind of new ideas it had brought into the field. Um, but for me also it was very much a matter of um, defining my own position as a work towards it, given that a, num a number of years had gone by, a number of issues had been raised in the meantime, a number of questions had come up that I sometimes could, sometimes could not deal with easily. And so I saw it as a kind of reckoning as well as an account of. Um, so it was a matter of trying to say what was valuable in it, what I think I thought was valuable in it, and what might survive, but also where it could be criticized, where it had fallen short, what other things had come up in the meantime that most descriptive work hadn't taken account of. Like what, for example? What specific problems could not be solved? One of the key issues, I think, is that um, descriptivism made very much of the issue of distinguishing between where the observer stands, the researcher, and the material on the table. So the, the meta level where you describe what happens on the ground, and then the object level as that which you describe. Descriptivism tried to stand back from what, uh, what it can observe. Um, and one of the issues that sort of haunted me for several years was what if that distinction is not so neat if, if the two are collapsed. And I remember sort of the exact moment, in fact, when that doubt was created. Um, and it took me quite a while to get around it. And eventually, I hope at least, I found an answer of kinds. But it was that kind of issue that had to be dealt with, I found. Was it an encounter with deconstruction? Uh, that's certainly, deconstruction heals it's, certainly, it certainly played a part. Uh, I think it was also a matter, well, I'll come back to that in a moment, it was also what I think of descriptivism eventually leading on to um, studying translation in social contexts, um, but being itself very much text-based and only text-based, it had difficulties uh, bringing in, as it were, the social context. The deconstructive moment, I think, was important in the sense that um, there was a conference in Ghent, in Belgium, in 1992, where a Dutch researcher, at that time a PhD student, so very rewarding for any PhD students uh, listening to this, that a PhD student can come up with a, uh, an idea that sort of throws, as it were, at least somebody like me and maybe other people as well. Um, and the idea was that when you study translation, you've got to phrase in your own terms what is there in that translation. When you look at a debate about translation, again, you have to account for it in the researcher's language. That transposition you could describe as a form of translating. And the point at this, Michael Matthijs Bakker, the point he was making was that it means that you translate translation even as you study it. And if you bring questions of norms into that, if, norms are, if translations are done according to certain norms, then whose norms are you using when you are translating into an academic language the material that you are studying? And that I found, this collapsing of the meta level and the object level, hit at one of the foundations, I think, of descriptive work. And for quite a long time, I found it very, very difficult to deal with. In that sense, 
deconstructive works, uh, the essays of Derrida, for example, uh, develop that kind of line and suggest that if you try to theorize translation from the top down, as it were, you will hit the brick wall eventually. And that, uh, as he does in his own essay on the, the Towers of Babel, um, you can run along with it, you can explore it in terms of the kind of images it produces, the kind of things it allows you to say and see. Does that feed into your current projects on the way different cultures perceive translation or the different concepts of translation? Up to a point, I suppose. It certainly made me aware of the fact that uh, you can look at translation in, in a range, in a number of different ways. Um, at the same time, descriptive work itself so it began with a very strong literary bias, so literary, canonical, Western text primarily, and as it expanded, as more people became interested in, in, in this kind of work, um, eventually people from different cultures and language backgrounds became involved, uh, Korea, Turkey, and so on. Um, and so that eventually led to the view that there is much more to translation, there's much more to be said, much more to be discovered also about translation um, that we haven't touched upon and that are worth saying as well. So that project, the, the one you're referring to, was a five-year project from 2000 to 2005 in which I was involved together with colleagues uh, at UCL and also at SOAS, so the School of Oriental African Studies in London, uh, that was aimed at uh, studying translations and translation theories, East and West, as the title has it. So to try to open up, as it were, non-Western approaches to translation, practices of translating, and to see how we could deal with them, knowing, of course, that we have to deal with them in English and that uh, that is loaded in a number of ways. You, you would have to translate literally and figuratively into English what happens in 7th century China, for example. At the same time, you're dealing with a language like English, which, for example, in the Indian context, is a heavily loaded language because it's also the colonial language. So there are historical and hermeneutic aspects that are difficult and problematical to negotiate, but are still very rewarding because it means you are dealing with things which are utterly alien uh, which go way beyond what we take for granted as being translation or as associated with translation in the West. So it's an eye-opener in many ways. That, that line of research seems to feed directly into your work with the International Association for Translation and Intercultural Studies, where you are chair of the Executive Council. No, that's right. Okay. Um, could you tell us a bit about the, the mission of, of, of the Association? Yes, IATIS was set up in 2004 um, in co during a conference in Korea. Um, its mission really is to create a platform that will be global for the discussion of translation. Um, and so we try quite deliberately to open ourselves, or to, or to not to open ourselves, that's the wrong term, to um, make available a forum that can bring in people from across the world. Uh, we have a number of, there are a number of countries that have national associations, there are a couple of international associations. EST is one of them, so the European Society for Translation Studies. Um, but they're very much located in one part of the world. So what we try to do is to set up uh, an association um, that is not exclusively Western, not even Western dominated. That's also why the first conference was in Korea. The second one is next summer in 2006, in July, in Cape Town. Uh, and we hope the third one will be either in South America or in India. At the same time, parallel to the globalization of translation studies, uh, translation studies is still dealing with the boycott of Israeli translation scholars. Have you got any public position to make on that point? Hmm. I haven't said anything public so far about this, as you probably know. I lost the time um, on the last one. Yes. Um, yes, the boycott, uh, I expect that many people who hear this will not know what it's about. Uh, it was a boycott started by Mona Baker, um, who runs a journal, a translator, and runs a publishing house, or was involved in a publishing house, uh, who ousted two Israelis on the, her advisory board, or editorial board. Um, I'm not happy, or I wasn't happy, with the way in which it was done. I can't really say I object to it in principle in the sense that, uh, just as I didn't object in the 60s or 70s or 80s, uh, I didn't object to the boycott of South Africa, for example. Um, I think we have similar issues here. So in that sense, I'm, I'm not opposed to it. 
in view of these divisions, do you think that um, the international association or even translation itself can do something to overcome these divisions? I don't think translation itself can do that. Although, of course, there is a, the beloved metaphor of translation as bridge building, but I think that's as much part of the ideology of translation than anything else. Um, I don't actually think the divisions are that important in the sense that they concern individuals and a very small number of individuals in the end. Um, they don't stop, for example, the, the migration of ideas, the generation of ideas. They don't stop uh, the overwhelming majority of people who work on translation uh, to meet and talk. Um, so I would hope that the various associations we have at the moment could at least have the, the generosity of spirit, as it were, to go on talking, uh, whatever their political divisions. Um, new so ideas will come up. ESG and IHS, for example, that too, hopefully. That, that too, hopefully. Certainly room for uh, collaboration and cooperation. Um, but also across the globe, I think most individuals, I think, are very much in need of contact. Uh, there are plenty of people in South America, in uh, Asia, in Africa particularly also, uh, where resources are, are limited in some cases, um, where they are quite keen to, to have the opportunity to publish material, to meet others, to debate with others about issues of translation, politics in a general sense, regardless of individual uh, frictions between this or that person. And that's, of course, much okay, more that important. Would be the you would see for that's what I hope will happen, yes, yes. If only because we can learn such an enormous amount. I mean, that, if that project that I mentioned earlier with SOAS uh, has taught me anything, it is that the world of translation is massively more interesting than, than we thought before, precisely because there are so many forms of translating, so many ways of thinking and speaking about translation in different cultures that we know next to nothing about. Thinking, for example, of oral cultures in Africa, they're quite a big issue um, of sort of the issues that have to do with multilingual societies, which in Western terms, we think in terms of um, languages associated with relatively homogeneous nation states, has been under-researched, if anything. There are large issues of that kind that are waiting to be resolved, discovered, at least dealt with, addressed. Okay. And that's what I hope will happen. Sure. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you.